number of fires plagued the town of St. John's, Newfoundland, during the 19th century, the last and most devastating of which was the Great Fire of 1892. The fire began when a lit smoking pipe was dropped in a stable at the junction of Freshwater and Pennywell Roads on July 8, 1892, around 4.45 in the afternoon. The fire spread rapidly down Freshwater Road and Cookstown Road. At the end of Freshwater Road, the fire separated, pursuing two different paths, one down Harvey Road, the other down Longs Hill. A number of unfortunate factors influenced the severity of the disaster. First, there had been little rain that month. This caused the wooden houses to be extremely dry and vulnerable to the fire. A second factor was the strong wind blowing from the northwest. The wind caused sparks to jump quickly from house to house. The fire was burning for more than 30 minutes before any attempts were made to extinguish the flames. The firemen were slow to reach the fire, and when they arrived, they were not prepared for the task they were facing. The firemen did not have the proper equipment to control the fire, and with work being completed on the water mains earlier that day, lack of water was another factor contributing to the scale of the devastation. Although the water had been turned on for some time, water could not yet reach the higher parts of the town where the fire had started, causing the water pressure to be too low to extinguish the flames. A nearby water tank had also not been refilled since its use in a recent training drill. The firemen were without their hatchets, and the rope they had was old, and it broke when they used it to try and make a fire break by pulling down a house which was already on fire. Aside from the unfortunate circumstances of the day, there was another critical factor. The town had not been rebuilt according to regulations set down following the Great Fire of 1846. In particular, Water Street and Duckworth Street were to be straightened and widened to 60 feet. Buildings were to be built of brick or stone with slated roofs, and fire breaks were to be made 60 to 80 feet wide. In spite of these building regulations, street patterns were left the same. Wooden buildings and houses were built, and fire breaks were not made. Failure to rebuild, in accord with these regulations, allowed the Great Fire of 1892 to spread throughout the town, devouring everything in its path. The fire lasted until early the following morning, burning for more than 12 hours, rarely leaving a building standing in its path and rendering more than 10,000 people homeless. The damage of the fire totaled about $13 million, of which less than $5 million was covered by insurance. In addition to the devastation of the town itself, four lives were lost during the fire. Henry O'Mara was a St. John's-born journalist who, had now making his life in Boston, had come back to St. John's to visit family. He was an observer of the fire. Imagine a sea, he said, of fire more than half a mile wide, sweeping along with a terrific roar, taking everything in its course of a mile to the wharves and the docks. Immense pieces of fire flying in advance of the main body, like carriers or pickets, set a dozen fires ahead of it, leaping into flames long distances away, forming a skirmish line on and on until the docks were reached. Of the accounts of the fire, one of the most complete is that by the Reverend Moses Harvey, who was a regular contributor to national and international journals, and he was everywhere on the day of the fire. His own church, the Free Presbyterian Church at the foot of Cathedral Street, burnt in the fire. His home at Devon Row survived. Here is his account. About five o'clock I noticed the glare of fire some distance beyond, near Freshwater Road. And hastening to the spot, I found three houses on fire. I remarked to my friend that this was a bad day for a fire. A high wind from the northwest was blowing, hurling the sparks far and wide on the roofs of the clusters of wooden houses. For a month previous, hardly any rain had fallen, and the shingled roofs were like tinder. The firemen were soon on the spot, but the supply of water was feeble, and their efforts to arrest the progress of the flames produced little effect. By a strange fatality, 
the water had been turned off in the morning in order to make some new connections of mains, and though it had been turned on again, its force on this high ground was slight. A tank, which was usually full, had been emptied the previous evening by the firemen when practising with their hose and by some stupid carelessness had not been filled. Soon half a dozen more houses were on fire, then twenty. The volume of flames increased, and the roaring wind hurled the burning brands in all directions, which, alighting on roofs at a distance, created fresh centres of fire. No one imagined that such a solid stone structure as the Anglican Cathedral could be burned, and for an hour before, the terrified people around had been carrying their valuables to it as a place of safety. The fiery tornado swept on. The intense heat melted the lead around the panes of glass, and the destroyer found an entrance. The stately cathedral, with all its contents, was soon a glowing mass of fire. The next morning I took a walk around the awful scene of devastation. It was heartrending. Nothing visible for a mile from Devon Row but chimneys and fallen or tottering walls. The thick smoke from the smouldering ruins still filled the air. Where yesterday stood the homes of 15,000 people, there were only ashes and debris, or walls and chimney stacks, ghastly in their nakedness. The wrecks of the fanes of religion stood out, then broken walls pointing heavenward, as if in mournful protest against the desecration that had been wrought. Another observer was W. J. Kent, a local politician and journalist. He remarked that while it was seen that the fire was of a more serious character than usual, no fears were entertained, even at this time, for the safety of the city generally and it was believed that the stone buildings of the main street would withstand the fury of the flames.